tonight we have a very special talk. Our speaker uh, is a PhD candidate and research assistant at uh, Waseda University in, I don't want to get this wrong, the High Energy Astrophysics Group in the Department of Physics. Um, his main focus is neutrino oscillations in core collapse supernovae. Does anyone know what that means? No. no. Maybe we'll find out. Uh, I think it means he's a very smart guy. Uh, so tonight, here to present the story of physics, we have Milad Delfan Azadi. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, you all for coming to this event today. And of course, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to talk. Uh, actually, I don't want to uh, name this event as a talk. I, I mainly want to talk about physics uh, and mainly I'd like to say it's a discussion. So you're always welcome to ask me questions and um, definitely I will ask you questions again. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> the, the concept of physics actually um, might be uh, unknown for many of you guys. So. Um, Today, the, t the title is the story of physics. All of us know what's the meaning of story, but I want to ask you, what is physics? Who knows? Just feel free to answer. Everything. Everything. Okay. Science. Say it a little bit louder. I heard yeah, science, please. space. What else? Yeah. Stop. Stop. Stuff. Stop. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> let me explain you in this way. Physics is a Greek word actually coming from physic or physica, which means the nature. And physics means a branch of science that deals with the nature and tries to understand how our universe and our nature behaves. This is the meaning of physics. So let me give you a brief introduction of physics nowadays, and then I'll be back to the, I mean, the, to the starting point, and I will tell you how this um, knowledge came from, and actually what's the origin of our knowledge. Nowadays, physics is just a normal topic in middle school, maybe, and in university, and all of you have heard about it a lot. And mainly you, I mean, uh, Many of the students ha are, are uh, having problem with this topic because it requires like mathematics and complicated equations that we have to deal with. But um, honestly, I think uh, it's not that difficult because if you, if you understand the language of physics, then everything is going to be easy for us. So today I'm trying to explain the language to you. Nowadays, we have two different branches of physics, which we call theoretical and experimental physics, which I got these questions from you that what's theoretical physics and actually what's experimental physics? I just can say, physics is a natural science, is a branch of natural science that whenever we say a physical law has been confirmed, the theory and the experiment should get the same result. Otherwise, we don't call it, I mean, it's approved. In, in astronomy and astrophysics, instead of experiment, what we, what we do, we do observations. It means that what we are doing, theory means what we are doing with a pencil and a pen, and we are trying to solve the formulas, and we get a result, a specific result. But in experiment, of course, again, we are trying to make some experiments about the, the same problem, and if what we see and what we are writing in our calculation, are the same, then we say that's been approved. For example, even the Big Bang, all of us have heard this name, Big Bang Theory. It's just a theory. It's not still proved in physics. I mean, physics society is not accepting that, actually. So, if I want to go back to history, I'd say even the, I mean, our ancestors, or imagine now we are living uh, in 2018 and we are living in a, in a cave, actually. So the cavemen, I believe that they were using physics too. 
but they didn't know that they're using physics. I want to ask you a question. Do you know how they were using physics? So someone living in a cave? Yeah. And how they're using physics? Yeah. Definitely they were doing But they didn't know that they were doing physics. Okay. Just when they, they, when they just want to go out and hunt, right? The arrow. And how to put that arrow to that animal? That's physics. And what metal that they're supposed to use to be able to kill that specific, I mean, animal or something? Using that specific metal is physics. And after that, I can say that physics, I mean, itself um, has been born from the time of Greeks. I mean, Greek people were the first ever people that tried to explain the laws of nature. And all of us know that Greece has produced many great scholars, right? Like, for example, Pythagoras. And if you know that, uh, I think uh, now fifth grade students, right? The minimum, the, uh, the grade that students are here, fifth grade. Have you heard about Pythagoras' formula? Still, we are using it in mathematics. It's not that difficult. I'll just explain later. Pythagoras was a person that lived between 582 to 497 BC. And he conducted experiments in harmony. He was just using uh, some strings in harmony in order of, for example, one and two. And by playing with them, he could make a pleasant sound. But he knew that if the order is just high, like for example, 500 to 501, the, the sound is not going to be pleasant. And he did a great equation. We call this a right angle. It means that we have a 90 degree angle here. And we will call this leg as hypotenuse. So the square of C is equal to the square of A plus the square of B. That's a very famous equation that still we are using in our daily calculation. And it's going to help us a lot to understand even the nature. After him, Zeno was another great Greek thinker. He was living 490 to 430 BC. And he nearly proved that the motion is impossible. Can you imagine that motion is impossible? And by philosophical fact, he was trying to prove it. And actually, he did at that time. And he tried to convince people, actually. I just can give you an example. Imagine I'm supposed to go from here to that wall. And the distance is just x, for example. If I want to go to this wall, I have to just come across here to reach this wall. OK, so imagine just the distance is just like, I don't know, one meter or two meter. Of course, it's more than one or two, so three or four meters. So by reaching to that wall, what I have to do, firstly, I have to come to the half of the length, right? Half of the distance. I mean, just if it's like four meters, I have to come to two meters. And then, from here to that place, again, I have to come to the half of it. Half, half, half. And these halves are not going to get end. So it means that I never can reach to that. It means motion is impossible. In his idea. And then, I think nowadays still it's working by... I mean, the students are trying to reach the spring break or summer break, but they're trying their best, but still, you know, they're thinking that, oh, long time or, or a long distance is still remaining. I will talk about this uh, paradox with this guy. He tried to resolve that paradox by saying that the matter is not infinitely divisible. I mean, he was the first person that was saying that the matter is made by atoms. 
And he was saying that the Zeno's paradox is not correct. Okay. It's not correct because if we are going to think like that, the person should be infinitely small. I mean, when I'm just going to reach to that ball, my size should be smaller and smaller and smaller. I mean, that distance that compared to my size should be smaller and smaller. So it's not possible for us. So that, that theorem was just declined by him. And probably one of the most famous guys was Aristotle. He was the tutor of great Alexander. And while great Alexander was trying to expand his empire, he was trying to expand his empire of knowledge. And he was lecturing for people based on uh, logic, and he was mainly was talking about biology and physics. And he was the first person who named this subject physics. But unfortunately, many of his ideas were wrong. And he was believing that our planet is the center of the universe. Or the geocentric universe, he was thinking. After him, Archimedes came between 287 to 212 BC, and probably he was one of the great physicists of, of Greece. And still some of his I mean, uh, works are applicable uh, now, still even nowadays. And we, we call it professionally as his principles that the body loses weight when it's immersed in water. Do you know what is the application of this theorem? Go for it. Yeah, please. Um, I think I heard that like what like the body yeah. is lighter compared to like water. Yeah. So I think that's why. Like, yeah, it could be. It could yeah. be. But you know, it it, it it has like even military applications. We just can easily, you know, just launch a ship in sea. And we know that, you know, ships are really uh, massive and they are so heavy. But when we put on a specific amount of water, so we can ride ships there. Right. And his famous Eureka, that when he was in bathroom, after that he could just get there. And one of his greatest ideas was in aesthetics also. And I intentionally put this in my class because it's so old notes. Not, not, and when, imagine, I, I think all of you just played this game, Seesaw, right? In, that Steve, maybe you are just doing it. But, he was thinking that if this is F is coming by force and this is a bay, and then the relation bit, I mean the ratio of F over W is equal to the ratio of this length, which is B over A. This is a still the principles of aesthetics. And he was thinking that if he has a very long rod, he even can maybe move the planet. The next guy who did a good I mean, uh, job in physics was Ptolemy. And he believed that the universe is concentric. And our Earth is the center of our universe again. His model was looking like this. Can you imagine? Sun is orbiting around our planet. He also did many studies in optics, the process of refraction, and did many experiments carefully, but unfortunately he couldn't reach the specific formula to be able to show that. 
You know, in physics, if we can't make something in formula, or we can't, I mean, um, bring mathematics. Mathematics actually is the language of physics. If we can't make it, it's a big loss. But nowadays, we know this formula by Snell's law, which I'm not going to talk about it. After Greek people, you know, uh, Nicholas Copernic was the person who did uh, a really revolutionary, let's going to say, it, in understanding of the universe. He was living between 1473 to 1543, and in his model, he stopped the sun and set the earth in motion. He tried to make his system in this way. This is our sun, and this is our planet. But, you know, it was a big claim, and definitely some of the scientists at that time were not leaving and were not trying to accept, but some were trying to do. Reinhold was one of them who could, uh, I mean, uh, write his book. Nowadays, still, uh, it's applicable, and uh, he used by what the system that Copernicus tried to show, he tried to write his book, but Tycho Brahe, a very famous astronomer, tried to not accepting it. But, you know, he was kind of a rich person, and he, was, uh, he had his private uh, observatory, so by what Copernicus already said, he could also, you know, believe in that Copernicus is right and the planet Earth is not locating in the center of the universe. And also, by his observations, he could reach to two big points that previously Aristotle was claiming that the heavens are unchanging and all natural motion is in circle. But what he observed was a flaring up of a new star. Chris tried to, to, to introduce me, and he said that he is studying neutrino oscillations in core plat supernova. Actually, what is core plat supernova? Supernova. Okay, let me go back to the origin of the name. You know, super and nova. Nova means the new and the born, right? Previously, the scientists were thinking that this effect, this is because of the born of a star. You know, when we see a very shiny thing in the sky, it means a star is just trying to born. But it's actually wrong. Supernova is a fate of, you know, it's, it's the end of the star actually. You know, the fate of all massive stars is just like maybe humans. All will die. And supernova is the end state of a star, which makes a very massive explosion. So he could observe that in 1572. And it was in opposite direction with what Aristotle already said. And again, in the next step, he just tried to show that a comet with elongated orbit. You know, he was just saying that all motions are in, sync, are in, are in circle, actually. Elon, I have a quick yep. question. Please. Over time, when yep. these uh, physicists came up with new ideas that contrasted old ones that yep. have been around for decades or hundreds yep. of years, yep. what was the general feeling like in society? Were these new ideas welcomed? Were they seen as like, you know, heresy, like going against old beliefs? Definitely, were not believing them, and they were against them, actually. You know, and um, because uh, <clears throat> you know, I will talk about uh, Galileo. You know, he's the very famous guy that uh, the society and, of course, even uh, the scholars at that time were trying to be against him. But what he he was trying to say, but um, 
maybe they were lucky also, you know, the media was not that high, you know, at that time, and um, the scholars were not the same as, just for example, nowadays. So, but yeah, uh, of course it was not so easy to, I mean, to convince them. For example, do you know, Aristotle was thinking that, okay, let me ask you a question, you know, uh, when I was just coming, you know, I was just, I just took a statue and a chocolate. So, of course, they have different mass, right? I mean, this is heavier than this statue, right? So, if I want to, you know, if they are in the same height, and I'm just trying to just, you know, drop them down, so what do you think? Which one is just reaching to the ground faster? Yeah, please. I think it's the same. It's the same. The one that has bigger mass. Okay. The same. The same. The same. Any other idea? And if you say the same, why? And if you say the bigger mass, why? Why the bigger mass is? I thought that uh, the mass was uh, the mass of uh, the go faster because it's bigger. Okay. And what? What? Why do you think that they are the same? Loudly, please. I can't hear you. I think they're the same because... Because? Maybe because the gravitation of the force is compared to the... Very good. Very good. So, you know about the gravitational force? Okay, great. Yes. But you know that Aristotle was thinking that the... The object with the heavier, I mean, with the with the uh, with the bigger mass, we reach or we hit the ground earlier. But Galilei, I mean, I'm just going to to talk. He said the same, and I will I will try to explain. But but your answer is really great, and I'm really happy for your answer. Uh, <clears throat> actually, the the greatest revolution happened at the time of Kepler, and still. His laws are, you know, um, like the first step for all astronomers and physicists to, to, to be able to understand the nature. And of course, he was uh, Tycho's student, and as I said, he tried to, you know, um, to use the Tycho uh, Brahas. Uh, data and, co and, and collect them, and after that he made three famous laws, which nowadays we just know them by Kepler's law. I'm not going to explain them in details because it requires like mathematics, and maybe you still are not familiar with the mathematics of ellipse and um, like focuses and stuff. But let me explain you in this way. The first law says that all planets orbiting our sun in an elliptical shape. This is ellipse. How can we make an ellipse? Imagine we have just two points, and there's a rod, and just we take a pencil, and we just try to round it. This is how we make an ellipse. This is called ellipse. And these two points are called the focus. So he believed that sun is in one of the focuses, and the planets are orbiting around Sun in these orbits. So this is the first law of Kepler. His second law, again, the Sun is in one focus, and the planet is trying to orbit. And the, I mean, the lens from the planet to the Sun in one period, okay, so, line sweeps out equal areas, you know. This area is exactly the same as this area in the same period. I mean, this line and this line. This took, for example, one month to the planet to come from here to here, and one month from here to here. So the area, if you connect these planets to the sun, the, these two areas are the same. And the third law says that the squares of orbital periods are, you know, orbital periods means that 
time takes that the planet to make the round are proportional to the cubes of the orbital semi diameter axis. After him, Galilei made, I mean, somehow approved uh, what the Copernicus was trying to say, and he tried, I mean, he did the first steps of the laws of the motion. And he knew that, uh, I mean, he somehow made a very famous uh, experiment that what I did now, I mean, he just went to the Pisa Tower, and this is the object with the heavier mass and the smaller one, and he proved that they're reaching, I mean, they're hitting the ground exactly in the same time. But if you want to read it to be precise, it's not the same time because of the, you know, air resistance. But the time difference is negligible, actually. And that's what exactly he said. It's because of the gravitational force. Which gravitational force, I don't bring the mathematical formula here that F of G equals to G, the capital G, which is the constant, into the, I mean, the first body mass, and the second one, which is the mass of the Earth. I mean, because the mass of this object, with, with the mass of our planet, you know, this mass is negligible. It's nothing compared to the mass of the planet Earth. So both of them are going to be the same. So that's why both of them are going to hit the ground at the same time. Of course, Galileo even at that time didn't know it. Newton proved it by equations. But Galileo also was the first person who did, uh, I mean, who did um, the astronomical telescopes and were, was looking at the heavens and trying to understand the nature of them. But uh, we do call this guy Ibn Haytham, but in English they call it Al Heaven. Uh, this guy made a big I mean, uh, projects and works on uh, optics. Aristotle was thinking that our, light, uh, our eye emits light. And that's why we can see the objects. I just repeat my word. Aristotle was thinking that our eyes emit light. That's why we can see the objects. But he said, no, it's not correct. We see objects by the light scattered from them. For example, I can see you and you can see me because of the scattered lights. And then he constructed the pinhole cameras and he also studied lenses. But he was not successful to make an astronomical telescope for himself. After him, Newton, I think. All of us have heard his name, and he's like a very great and giant guy. And his contribution to physics made, made people to believe that physics is over. I mean, just, you know, there's nothing left. He just always, I mean, um, where, you know, uh, he was a great mathematician too, and whenever he couldn't explain some um, a physical phenomena, he was just trying to create a mathematical formula for it, and by that formulation, he could just explain this physical phenomenon. Binomial theorem, like what we are studying in our, I think, elementary or middle school, like A plus B, and then when this A plus B raised with, I mean, square, you just A square plus 2AB plus B square, a plus B, then with the power of 3, I mean, or cubed, is going to be A cubed plus B cubed, 3 AB, and blah, blah, right? So these are called binomial theorem, and he did. And in calculus, he made, like, integration, differentiation, and stuff. Of course, Leibniz, the German mathematician, was in the same time with him, and he was also contributing these things. But Newton is very famous by his understanding in physics. 
and of course the law of gravitation. And as your friend said, that f of g, he said, what makes this apple to hit the ground or the head of the Newton is exactly the same that moon orbits around our planet. One question. Uh, you guys know that the moon orbiting around Earth, right? And do you think that we can see both sides of the moon? I mean, for example, imagine this is just like a... This is moon. Is it orbiting like this that we can see all, all parts of the, of, of the moon? No. No? Okay. Just, we, can, we see just one, one side of that moon, right? And do you know why is that for? Yeah, please. It's because... <coughs> The sun emits the light, which reflects on the moon. Yeah. And then from there, the orbits around it, and since this thing went, placed the whole time, you see those places that emit of the moon at the same time. I don't know. Um, at first, you were just correct that, yeah, sun, I mean, the, the moon is just reflecting the light from the sun. But unfortunately, the second step, it's better to say that we only see one phase, I mean, one phase of the moon or one side of the moon because of this law again. I mean, it's like the Earth is just like pulling and just, you know, like that. You know, they are just like trying to, you know, um, when, I, when I was a child, I was just saying this thing, but now I can't remember it. Uh, if you remember, just please help me. <laughs> oh, like tether, like a tether ball. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just, yeah, yeah. just trying to. Uh, then suddenly, just. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but you know, uh, Newton also uh, tried to explain um, the behavior of the light. You know that we know that light behaves like a particle and a wave. And Newton was just trying to make a prism and understand the, how this light behaves. But after him, you know, uh, as I said, after Newton, uh, people were just believing that physics is just over and it was just type of boring science that all the questions has been answered. But suddenly, few questions came up and that made us to... Uh, reached the point that we are at the moment and we call it modern physics or quantum physics. And at the same time, in the early, uh, year, I mean, at the early of the 20th century, um, relativity also, you know, came to the physics and made us to understand this uh, universe much better. And m maybe you guys uh, heard about relativity. Right? Have you heard about relativity? Anyone heard of the theory of relativity? And um, do you know who was the person who was working in that theory? Albert Einstein. Perfect. Albert Einstein was doing. And what relativity means? What does it mean? Loudly, please. I don't remember the, uh, the full meaning, but I okay. remember that um, uh, E equals energy. Oh, yeah. E is equal to energy, okay. MC, MC um, squared. MC squared. Okay, oh. what does that mean? Energy equals... Yeah, it equals I think M means motion. Oh, yeah. Motion, M, but I don't know. No. no? Mass. M is mass, yeah. And C? Any parents know? Yeah, please. Uh, it's it's um, energy. Um, energy is mass uh, at speed of light. Yeah, square. Yes, exactly. Oh. Yeah, but before that, you know, it's just can be, um, you know, Einstein. You know, this is actually the most famous formula in 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 like 20th century. But I want to ask you a question, like, what actually relativity means, you know? Um, you, you guys heard about, like, general relativity and special relativity. 
right? And these two things are different. You know, um, I'm just going to talk about this. This, uh, I mean, two theorems uh, specifically. And of course, I don't understand. For even physicists, is a very tough topic to understand. It requires non-Euclidean mathematics and many other, mm, I mean, uh, mathematic backgrounds. But it's easy to explain what relativity is, which I'm going to tell you. You know, uh, theory of relativity, as I said, has special and general relativity. So, in special relativity, we are dealing with two, I mean, uh, two principles. The first, you know, I just wrote them in words, and I'm just going to read it and focus on the word. The principle of relativity says, the laws of physics are the same for any inertial reference frame. Oh, is it Okay, I'm going to ask You know, I'm pretty sure that you understood the laws of physics are the same for any inertial reference frame. What's this three words definition? I mean? And what uh, I mean, what the word relative means? Okay, let me give you an example. Imagine there is a train that is going from south to north. Okay, a train that is going from south to north, and two guys are playing ping pong in the train. Okay, so again, a train is just moving from south to north, and two guys are just playing ping pong. And they're just playing, and the speed of that ball is just two meter per second to the north, and two meter per second to the south. Right? That's, they're just playing, right? Okay. And imagine, there is an observer. So I said, south to north. And the observer is here. What does he see? A ping pong ball going... I don't know. <laughs> what does he see? He sees that the ball, that it's going from south to north, has 30... Two, it means 30 plus 2 meter per second speed. But the one that is coming from north to south, because the train is moving with a speed of 30, has 28 meter per second. It means the measurement of the motion, the measurement of the motion is related to the position and velocity of the observer. That's the relativity. Related. And the second principle is the speed of light. The speed of light in a vacuum is the same for all observers. Do you know how much is the speed of light? It's in Japanese, but It's what, what Kimika know? Yeah, definitely she knows. Kimika, <laughs> high school student from Kais. Yeah, three times ten raised to the eight meter per second. And I'm going to explain about some interesting things that we know from the relativity. Time relation. Do you know that the time will pass slower for someone that is trying to travel with the speed of light? Imagine, you know, instead of just riding a car, we are just on a particle or on something that the, its speed is 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second. So, at that time, the time goes slower. <coughs> If compared to the person that is just looking at you, or is it? And the length 
contraction. When objects appear shorter, the faster they are moving in relation to the object. Time and gravity. When the gravity is a lot, is huge amount of gravity, time goes slow. Can you give an example of that? Like, do we see that anywhere? Yeah, exactly. Either on Earth or in the universe? You know, uh, for example, sun, right, is a very heavy object. And imagine we are just going, trying to pass, you know, this near, near by sun. So at that time, yeah, the time is this. And you know, uh, there is a joke in physics community in Japan that they are saying that in Japan the gravity is not that strong because time flies in Japan, you know. <laughs> yeah. Simultaneously with Einstein, uh, his colleagues and the other physicists were trying to understand the structure of matter. Sir William Crookes was the person who was trying to understand the structure of matter by doing a very famous experiment. What he did, he was trying, you know, uh, he just had a... Have you, have you, have you uh, studied about this experiment before? Have yes. you seen this? Yeah. Uh, kind of, I don't know what it means. Okay. So, you know, this is a very high voltage source. The voltage is so high, and we are trying to connect them to the cathode and the anode in a vacuum. And he tried to see what happens. He see that the rays are emitting from cathode part to the anode. And then, he, of course, I mean, announced this result to the other scientists and other physicists. So they tried to put a wheel here. And they saw that the wheel is just rotated. And they were wondering whether they are electromagnetic wave or not. Who knows what's electromagnetic wave? What's an electromagnetic wave? Sorry, come again. A magnet like being on and off. No. Electromagnetic wave. Yeah, please. Uh, magnetism, magnetism caused by electricity and batteries. Uh, Louder, please. I can't hear you. Um, Yell at him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, magnetism caused by uh, electrical materials like batteries. Okay, so I, I, we can just explain in this way also the wave, you know, electromagnetic wave, the waves that have electrical and magnetic fields. Electromagnet, right? So even the light, you know, the examples are just like radio waves, X rays, lights, gamma rays, and so it depends on the frequency. So they were wondering whether they are or not. And whether they are charged particles or not. Do you have any suggestion how to understand whether they are charged particles or not? It's very easy. The scientists were wondering whether these particles that are trying to move this wheel, whether they are charged particles or not. How did they understand whether they are or not? Very simple. By just using a magnet, right? If you put a magnet, just you can see that you know the behavior changes. Okay, I asked you already this question. And the next is the female that she contributed to physics. I mean, and she got two Nobel prizes in chemistry and in physics for her work that made her to discover polonium and radium. And of course, um, she could explain 
the effects of radioactivity. And the radioactivity decay. Okay, one question. Who knows what's radioactivity? Do you know from the glass? Yeah. Oh. What's radioactive? It's like energy coming off of an object, a natural object. Actually, it could be more. But, um, if it comes from light. It's so hard to explain that. Okay. Uh, who knows what's isotope? Isotope? Yeah. Yeah, yeah please. A bit loudly and slowly, please. When an element has more neutrons than a proton. Exactly. So, the atoms that have same number of protons and electrons, but different neutrons. They say they are isotopes of, like for example, hydrogen or in that. Okay, so isotopes, some of them are very, you know, stable. I just can't call them stable. And some of them are not. Those unstable isotopes are try, I mean, they, they radiate. Okay. And they, then we call it radioactivity. They radiate and uh, they make the radiation. And I, you know, this picture might be a bit difficult, but I wrote them in, I mean, words also. We have three different types of radioactivity. Alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha decay is when there are too many protons. Uh, yeah, here. Imagine, there are too many protons, so the emission is going to be positive charged. And in the case that we have too many neutrons, negative charge is going to be gained. And when there are just huge amounts of energy, gamma rays are going to, I mean, gamma radiation is going to come. So we call them as alpha, beta, and gamma rays. J.J. Thompson, a great physicist and a very famous one, and he was believing that atoms must have internal structure. Okay, mm, of course we know that atoms have internal structure and we know the three basics of them, right? What, what, what they are? Internal structure. I just told you guys, electrons, what are the more two? Protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons, okay. Electrons are negatively charged, right? How about protons? Protons are? Someone is saying positively, but it's not loud. Yeah, positive, of course. And neutrons are? Neutral. Neutrons, neutral, right? Okay. But he was believing that uh, they are all kept in a plum pudding model. You know, it's like the negative, the negative parts are like these bombs, and the positives are distributed. He was believing that the structure of atom is like that. But after him, Rutherford came, and of course he was one of the pioneers of the nuclear physics and the radioactivity, and of course also one of his great jobs were discovering proton, and also he tried to explain the inner structure of an atom, that protons and neutrons are at the core, and the electrons are orbiting around it. 
But after him, a Danish scientist, Niels Bohr, came and just slightly corrected Rutherford's uh, I mean, uh, theorem. And he says that atoms are like different planets, you know, they are in different orbits. I mean, electrons are orbiting around the nucleus. But Rutherford, they're believing that all electrons are in the same orbit. So orbitals was his job. Photon and light. Photon is a quantum of electromagnetic radiation. Who knows what's the meaning of this quantum? I already said what's electromagnetic, wave or radiation. So what's the meaning of quantum? You, you guys may hear about quantum mechanics, quantum physics, and these stuff a lot. What's quantum actually? Do you have any idea? Of that? Quantum is actually the plural of quanta. What that quanta means? Just say it out loud. Yeah, please. Super small. Super small, perfect. Yes. It means a unit. That we can't break it even smaller. You so know? smaller than an atom. Exactly. So, you know, um, lights have the wave and particle behaviors. We, we already, you know, and many scientists try to explain the wave behavior of the light, but the particle behavior, if we want to show, is by, you know, but just trying to say that the light is emitting, you know, in, in order of units. And that's quantum. Photons have zero mass. They have, they're, they're really massless. And they have no electric charge, and they're subatomic particles, actually. And they interact with matter. does this mean? I got a question from one of the students that what Einstein is famous for? So Einstein of course is famous for his theory of relativity and his experiment in sorry in photoelectric effect and actually you know he didn't get Nobel Prize because of his theory of relativity he got the Nobel Prize because of photoelectric because the theory of relativity is still, you know, uh, until last year was in doubt because we couldn't detect it. But photoelectric effect, what happened, you know, um, again, almost the same experiment as Crook did, but here he tries to emit, uh, you know, light. And he saw that, you know, photoelectric effect, that when we, I mean, radiate photons, electrons are just going to move, you know. And, okay, so when we emit this photon to this plate, electrons are emitted. So that's what we call photoelectric effect. So it means photons are interacting with matter. That made a new story and new field in physics, which we call it quantum physics. Isn't that how uh, like yes. a solar panel works as well? Yes. And even nowadays, you know, we are trying to even, you know, the particle accelerators and stuff. I will explain briefly about that. Quantum mechanics. This guy Schrödinger and Schrödinger cat might be very famous for you guys, but these equations I'm not going to explain. Um, of course, uh, you know what he did in quantum mechanics is exactly what uh, Newton's laws of motion tried to explain, and is a branch of physics that works that what's actually inside the atoms. I mean, for example, you know, in, in classical physics. You just try to explain, um, for example, if, okay, one, one question, if a car is trying to go from uh, Tokyo to Kyoto, for example, 
and with a speed of 60 km per hour. And if you know how long is the distance between the Tokyo and Kyoto, it's so easy for us to understand uh, how long does it take by easy calculations like velocity equals to displacement over time. That's easy, but how about the particles? When they want to travel, how can we I mean, uh, measure and how can we calculate the dynamics? Elementary particles, as I, I, I mean, I, I told you already in my talk that photon is an elementary particle, or it's believed that, or without knowledge, that elementary particles doesn't have any, I mean, smaller particles. So now we believe that these elementary particles don't have anything smaller than them. And this is called the standard theoretical, uh, or the standard model in, in particle physics, actually, that these uh, part is uh, different with these greens and the red one. So there are quarks, leptons, and gauge bosons. Definitely uh, understanding about these particles uh, gave us a better understanding of the universe. Today I'm not going to talk about these things in details because it's going to be a bit more complex and we don't have enough time, of course. Um, just for some example, I just can say a proton is made up of three quarks. Two up and one down. But neutron is vice versa. Two down and one up. I mean, these particles, so, are made of these things. And understanding the subatomic particles, like neutrinos, neutrino oscillations, my, my topic that I'm currently doing, in core lab supernovae, I mean, neutrinos are playing a key role in the explosion mechanism of the core lab supernovae. I mean, they make that explosion. And they are in different flavors, electron, muon, and talon. Understanding the particles is giving us a bright understanding and, um, how can I say, I mean, uh, understanding of the particles can give us uh, a better understanding of the universe because we believe that universe is made up of these particles. It, I mean, our understanding of astronomy or astrophysics is not like what our ancestors were trying to do or just by observing. how these atomic particles behave and how they are trying to help us um, to understand what our universe is made of. And also, understanding these subatomic particles is, is making some advances in technology for us. You know, uh, particles accelerators. Uh, you might hear about CERN. And like in Japan, we have the Springgate, J Park, and KEK. And I was doing my research for two years at KEK in Tsukuba, which uh, the synchrotron radiation uh, experiments in X-ray physics group we were conducting. What synchrotron radiation? You know, it's it's quite simple. I can say that you know there's a filament, and you're trying to hit that filament, and an electron is just released, and there were big amount. I mean big size of the magnets, like the same size of this building, were there. And those big, I mean, magnets were just in that circular, you know, in, in particle accelerators, you have, I mean, two types, like circular and the straight one. In circular one, uh, that we were just doing our experiments, those magnets, you know, when an electron is in a very big magnetic field, it's trying to accelerate. And it speeds up almost the same, I mean, speed of the light. And suddenly, you know, it's like a car engine, for example, just trying to turn, for example, left to right, you have to, you know, uh, lower your speed. So then, that's, you know, when it's just trying to turn left or right, 
you know, it emits some radiation. That, and we were just detecting, for example, a specific like wavelength, for example, X-ray, just we were in X-ray physics group. And then we were trying to understand, for example, at that time, you know, the Fukushima Daiichi's uh, the rice, we were just trying to check whether the cesium is in those, I mean, rice or not, and whether they are healthy for our body or not. And, of course, uh, particle accelerators are also helping us to understand better, in, I mean, in, medi uh, in medicines and in biophysics. And understanding uh, modern physics helps us to, uh, to get better and more precise telescopes. And, yeah, what, uh, what is going to be the next, no one knows, and we hope that our uh, efforts about understanding the universe uh, one day will let us know and understand where do we come from and what's going to be the fate of all of us. Uh, in physics, we do believe that what we call the beginning is often the end, and to make an end is to make the beginning. And end is where you started from. Thank you very much.